Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so hello, everyone. Uh, today we will have uh, we have a special guest, Dr. Yan Wei, and he's going to introduce his projects. Okay, shall I start? Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you, Aleva. Uh, okay. Also, thank you for uh, having me here to speak uh, and to also introduce my lab. So, uh, the title of my lab is called Computational Material Science for Energy Applications. Uh, this is a research lab and the national lab Astana. So in the national lab, lab Astana, so probably you know where it is, uh, we have two centers, uh, one center for life science, and there's also a center for energy and advanced material science. And I mean the center for energy and advanced material science. In this center, we have four research labs and the one of the lab is doing computational work. So I'm kind of uh, leading this lab on the computational studies. Okay. Uh, in addition, I'm also from the chemical and materials engineering department. Okay. Uh, just to briefly introduce, like the who I am. So uh, I joined NU at in 2019. So almost three years now. Uh, and before that, I worked in a company. Uh, it's a company, but it's also a research center. It's called the State National Lab for uh, High Performance Civil Engineering Materials. I will introduce a little bit of the work that we did there. Uh, so basically, we are working with concrete. So it's a construction material. And we are working with the different chemical additives to produce high performance concrete. The, uh, before uh, moving to industry, I worked uh, as an associate professor in Suzhou University in China. Uh, so I worked there for five years and I did a postdoc at the University of Minnesota in the United States. Uh, before that, I spent quite some time in Denmark, in Copenhagen. So I did my master, my PhD, and also two years postdoc at the Technical University of Denmark. Yeah. Uh, I got my undergrad study, uh, my undergrad degree from Zhejiang University. Uh, in China. Uh, Zhejiang University, uh, well, it's, it's, it's one of the best universities in China. And uh, in particular, we had the first chemical engineering department in China. So I think we had the first, uh, the first chemical engineering department throughout the country was established in Zhejiang University in 20, uh, I think 1927, so almost 100 years ago. Um, and then I spent my fourth year in an exchange program. So I, uh, it's like my, I spent three years at the Zhejiang University and then I had a fourth year in Japan uh, where I started learning uh, modeling and the simulations. Okay. Um, those are the courses that I'm teaching here at Nazarbayev University. Uh, uh, yes, so those are different courses I'm teaching here. They belong to uh, kind of three categories. There is something called like, this kind of uh, uh, common engineering courses, like engineering mathematics. Okay. And then uh, I'm also teaching uh, undergrad fluid mechanics. And then uh, there's also advanced, uh, like graduate courses that uh, is kind of advanced fluid mechanics or something we call uh, more related to processing of polymers. Uh, so that, that's why my research area kind of related to the flow of complex fluids and, and then polymer processing. I'm also teaching uh, courses on molecular modeling or computational materials engineering. So ranging from undergrad courses to master courses and also PhD courses. Okay, so that's, that's my uh, kind of main research area here at the NU. And nowadays, because we do all the teaching online, so we have all the teaching materials. If you are interested in any of the subjects, just let me know. I can share the materials with you. Mm, okay. So I mentioned about this Center for Energy and Advanced Materials. Uh, it's, it's called the Center for Energy and Advanced Material Science. Uh, same. So the director, the center director is Professor Jumabai Bakhinov. Uh, and then we have four research labs. 
There's a research lab on advanced materials and the renewable energy. So that deals mainly, mainly with the solar cells. And then we have also sustainable energy and environmental systems, a laboratory of advanced materials and systems for energy storage. So you might ha have heard of like uh, research on lithium ion batteries or capacitors in, in the center. So those are the uh, work of my colleagues. So I'm uh, leading one of the lab on material science, computational material science for energy applications. So in my lab, all the research work are purely computational. So we, we don't do research like uh, experimental research in my lab. We, all, the, all the research is theoretical and computational. Uh, some of the work can be done using paper and pencil, like a very old fashion. So if you students want to work with me, it could happen that you can just do all the research at home uh, by deriving equations and solving equations. But nowadays, many of the equations are very difficult to solve by paper and pencil. We have to be very lucky to find those kind of equations. So usually we have to rely on computers. Uh, so we use laptops, uh, workstations, clusters, and also uh, supercomputers, so-called supercomputers in our research. I don't really have a physical lab. Well, I do, I have a research office. Uh, but there are computers there. So nowadays, all the researchers working with me, they are working from home or from their dormitory. Uh, so uh, if you want to take a tour of my lab, it's, it's kind of like it's going to be a virtual, virtual tour. Yeah? Um, but the idea of having this competition lab is to kind of integrate all this experimental work, theoretical work, and simulation work together. You know, we are trying to develop uh, like energy solutions and advanced materials using experimental, theoretical, and computational approaches. Okay, so that is the center. So what kind of energy materials we are interested in? Um, most of the research work that we have been working on are related to ion batteries, like lithium ion batteries, or sodium ion batteries, etc. So batteries is a main uh, topic. But we also work with other type of uh, energy solutions or renewable energy solutions. For example, solar, uh, solar energy. And uh, in, my, like in my competition lab, we are, we are not really limited to uh, the kind of which type of energy solutions we are, uh, like we are working on, but it's more like, uh, you know, um, like for example, our collaborators, they might have uh, kind of computational demands and they will come to us and then we can just collaborate together. I earlier, I mentioned that I work with the high performance concrete. You know, actually concrete, even though it's like a ordinary building material, but if you think about nowadays, about all those renewable energy solutions, especially for example, wind, wind energy or hydro uh, energy and also nuclear power plant, in all those areas, we use a lot of concrete like high performance concrete. So there are a lot to optimize about the concrete properties to make it more durable, have better mechanical properties, etc. And so to some extent, we kind of work with all the all those different energy solutions. And as you know, this is a very hot topic uh, and is one of the biggest challenge to all humankind in this century, right? To find the renewable solution, energy solutions. Okay. So uh, I would like to introduce the research in my lab from uh, like a few different perspectives. One of the perspective is from material science. Uh, I think we are all familiar with materials, but uh, here at NU, we don't really have a material science department. But uh, usually if you study material science or if you study materials, uh, traditionally we are kind of concerned about uh, what we call the uh, PSPP relations. Uh, what is PSPP is uh, processing uh, structure. So like how I make the material and what kind of structure it has and what are the properties. So uh, processing structure properties. And then if I use the material for some applications, what is uh, its performance? So this is the so-called PSPP 
relations. So if you study material science, or if you are interested in material science, this is one of the fundamental scientific question uh, we are trying to answer in material science, is what are the relations between uh, processing structure, property, and performance. But this uh, nowadays has been considered as what we call the traditional approach. But there has been a newer approach. Why there is a newer approach? Uh, the reason is nowadays, uh, all the uh, like materials or devices that we use, I think a better word is device or systems, we are use, uh, kind of we, we use in, for different applications. They are not a single component materials anymore. Sometimes we do have pure, com pure materials, like um, for example, certain type of metal. But most of the materials we are using nowadays are material systems or uh, assembly of different types of materials, or for example, composite materials, etc. Again, take the example of concrete. You know, it, it, usually we think, okay, it's concrete, but actually, concrete is a very complicated, com, com, uh, com, uh, what we call composite material, right? If you look at what is inside the concrete, there are different types of materials. Okay, so we have the individual uh, material components, but then when you put them together, uh, there is also interfaces between different types of materials. So nowadays, a lot of research has been focused on interactions between different uh, types of materials or different faces in a composite material or interface optimization and design, etc. cetera. Okay. Uh, you see, this actually brings uh, more like a broader kind of subtopics for scientific research because you know previously we, well, we already have many types of materials now you put them together and we study the interface between the materials so th this is actually makes the field more like broad yeah? okay so this is the uh, materials science perspective and because of that nowadays also in, in our own lab we study a lot of problems that are related to interfaces for example uh, interface between different material components or material interfaces between different faces. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm uh, from the chemical engineering department. Okay, even though it's, it's called chemical and materials engineering, but the undergrad program we have is, is chemical engineering. So in chemical engineering, well, what do we study? Well, uh, if we look at the historic kind of perspective, the, the subjects of chemical engineering has also evolved uh, significantly. So if you think about 100 years ago, that's where we start to have the discipline of chemical engineering. At that time, people focus on a lot on unit operations. Uh, what do we mean by unit operations? That is, if you go to a chemical plant or chemical factory, you see the different components. Those are the unit operations. Okay, the different uh, unit operations. So in the very, very early days, uh, what do we study in chemical engineering? We study different unit operations and how we combine them together. Okay, so that's uh, the main subjects of chemical engineering about a hundred years ago. And then slowly uh, people kind of, uh, uh, at least in academia, in universities, we kind of look more into the physics and also the mathematics of uh, those chemical engineering processes. Uh, for example, uh, nowadays we have usually the, the core courses in chemical engineering are like fluid uh, transport or mass transport and heat transfer. So those are the what we call the transport phenomena. This, this makes chemical this discipline of chemical engineering more like physics oriented. We study a lot of the kind of physical principles underlying all those interoperations. And also the more intensive use of a mathematics in chemical engineering. So modeling, okay, modeling in chemical engineering. I think about uh, uh, like, I think about like 40 years ago, so like from 1980, at that time in chemical engineering, all those uh, unit operations, they have more or less well, has been, uh, they have been more or less well established so uh, at that time, people consider, okay, 
So we have these different processes and how we can integrate them together. So that, that's one, like system integration, integration of different uh, components. And also uh, there's uh, like a strong emphasis on product design. So this is more like you know custom oriented. Okay, suppose I want to make this kind of product, you know, or in the market there's a demand for certain type of products, how I can make them. So this is more like we go backwards and then find the optimal uh, chemical engineering process to make the product. So that is the uh, kind of the main uh, research topic in chemical engineering in the past uh, 30, 40 years. And from about 10 years ago, um, people focus more in chemical engineering on what we call the uh, system digitalization and also the what we call the uh, circular economy to make the process more sustainable, to make the product design more sustainable. Okay, so that's, that is more or less what we do in chemical engineering. And now if you think about the, okay, so suppose we want to find the solutions for renewable energy, okay? We might need a certain type of products. And then we can use this idea in chemical engineering product design to find the optimal process to make the product. For instance, like, okay, lithium ion battery. Okay, we can also take this kind of chemical engineering design approach to optimize uh, lithium ion batteries. Okay, uh, so uh, what exactly we do in my lab? Well, we study different types of energy materials and devices by using advanced computational techniques. Uh, we do not really limit our kind of uh, research to a particular type of uh, computational methods. So we actually use, okay, what is whatever is available. So we, a lot of research, a lot of our research relies on like uh, underlying theories. So like what has been developed in the chemical and material science area. So different types of modeling and the simulation methods. And nowadays there's also a strong focus on uh, data science, uh, data informatics, and also uh, machine learning. So we haven't really started uh, doing research using this uh, like uh, machine learning in our research, but we have been uh, planning this for quite some time. So we are also actively learning those uh, new techniques and we try to use it in our research. I think those are great opportunities for like young students. Uh, okay, because, uh, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, even professors are also learning this kind of new stuff. So we can learn together and make use of them together. Yes, but the idea is to model different energy systems the material systems, trying to understand uh, what's going on, like understand the chemical physical behavior in those systems. And we are trying to make predictions for some of the properties. And, and if we can make good predictions or reliable predictions, maybe we can use our model to optimize the performance of those systems and also even to design new systems. So that is the ultimate goal. Okay, uh, based on our own, own like a re background, we kind of focus mostly on like polymer materials and also composite materials. Like the many of the materials we, you can think of nowadays are composite materials. Okay, and also interfaces between different material components. Uh, from a chemical engineering perspective, we study actively on different transport processes, fluid transport, and all. So, for example, heat transfer, etc. Now we study a lot on this uh, the physical chemistry at interfaces. For instance, like a liquid solid interface. Uh, those are like actually, I mean, a lot of research has been done already. But we are nowadays we have better modeling tools, better computational tools, so we can understand better what's going on at the interface, and also uh, chemical reactions, which is a very important kind of uh, topic, subject in chemical engineering. Okay, so those are the uh, broadly, just in a broad sense, the areas we are interested in. Okay. So what are the tools we are using? What are the kind of the research methods? 
in the broad sense, uh, you know, nowadays, uh, uh, I mean, compared to, I don't know, before computers were invented, we have a more diverse, like, uh, research approaches, I mean, re or research methods. Uh, this has been nicely summarized in a review article published a few years ago. This is a, it's a nice, very nice read. In this review article, the authors propose that we have these different uh, stages or different paradigms ranging from what we call the empirical science to more like a model-based or, th or theory-based science, and then competitional-based. Here, they are mostly referring to the uh, physics-based modeling, okay, physics-based competition approaches. And uh, starting from maybe 10 or 20 years ago, we have this uh, like shift to more like data-based or big data-based. Uh, in my uh, opinion, we do not, it's, it's, I mean, even though, okay, so we have those new approaches, this may more available approaches to do, to do research, but uh, it's not like, okay, we can replace the other methods using a newer method, but rather it's like, now we have more available, more approaches available. It's like we have a toolbox, but now we have more tools in this research toolbox. Okay, we, have, we can do experiments. We can also do uh, like theory, fundamental theory. And also we can do physics-based modeling. Also we can do data-based modeling. So even for the same, like and the same material system, like or even for the for the same scientific problem, we can approach the problem, we can solve the problem using a combination of all those approaches. Uh, this is the like main uh, characteristic of the research projects that I'm going to introduce in a few minutes. So it's more like uh, we have uh, integrated efforts. So we, we have people doing experiments. We also have people doing modeling. So in the end, we're trying to combine all those knowledge together to have a better understanding, okay? So uh, as I said, in my lab, we focus mostly on, at the moment, we focus mostly on physics-based modeling. modeling. Uh, but it, it is planned that we will more actively Involve database modeling and machine learning in our research. Uh, in in the in our lab, we do have a team working with machine learning, but at the moment, is we haven't done much work re related to materials and energy applications. So, uh, for the physics-based modeling, uh, we have a, a diverse methods, or we we are using many different methods. And under this topic of physics-based modeling, and the reason is okay. If you think about uh, okay, what do we study in physics, uh, we have, uh, for example, for uh, at the at the very small scale, like atomic scale, okay, we can we can do quantum mechanical studies, rely on uh, quantum mechanics, and then if you move up to like classical systems, we can do classical mechanics. And then this, you can move up further to the continuum level to do uh, like continuum modeling, okay? So all those methods are actively used in my lab. We have different tools to do those kind of modeling, uh, but we, we, we do not invent those tools because our work is more like focus on the application side. So we those tools are developed by researchers all over the world. And then we, we use those uh, tools. So we learn how to use those tools and we make use of those tools in our research. Okay, so our, our work, at least on the modeling part, is more like a, a application oriented. Okay. For instance, uh, okay, what are, the, what are the tools available? We use we, for classic, for quantum chemical calculations or, or, or quantum mechanics based electronic structure calculations, we have something called VASP, something called Gaussian, something called CASTAB and the CP2K, etc. Uh, so if you are interested in those subjects, you can just Google those words, you can find the, 
you know, many tutorials on those different tools. And those tools are also actively used in industry. I mean, not only in academic universities, they are also actively used in industry to design uh, materials. Okay? For molecular dynamic simulations based on classical mechanics, uh, we use mainly lamps and, and the Grumax. We also have access to something called Material Studio or Espresso, etc. Uh, and for continuum modeling, we have uh, console, uh, open form, etc. Uh, some of the tools are licensed software, but our university, I mean, fortunately, our university uh, have access to most of those licensed software. Many other tools that I listed here are open source uh, software or open source packages, so which we can we can use. In principle, we can also modify and then adjust it to our system. But that's that is more uh, demanding. It takes uh, takes a lot a lot of skills to be able to modify those codes. So for the moment, our work is mostly uh, application oriented. Okay. Uh, this is a, a slide I, I like it a lot. It's like, okay, so why we're doing computational research? Uh, or I, I often argue, uh, or I often uh, propose to my colleagues, I mean, this is the right time to do computational research. The reason is, if you think about uh, what is available now and what is available, 20 years ago or 40 years ago or, or, or 60 years ago. Yeah. So many of the tools in many areas have not evolved too much. But in the area of computational studies or computers, this has, has been evolving uh, in this you know, exponential scale over the past uh, Actually, a lot of years, past 30, 40 years, there has been this exponential growth in computational power. So, I mean, we, we all have experience to this. If you think about the mobile phones that you use, uh, that uh, the mobile phones now are more, more powerful, <laughs> the one that you have in your pocket is actually more powerful than this supercomputer. Uh, in, that was released in 1964. But even if you look at the supercomputer in 1980s, your mobile phone is more powerful than that one either, uh, that, that one too. Yeah? So there has been a significant growth in the computational power. And, and there's also a big hope, you know, nowadays people, a lot of people are talking about, you know, quantum computing, etc. cetera. I mean, that is, that is the future, yeah, right? We don't, uh, we don't really use them for computational studies now, but uh, it could be that uh, in the future, there will be a more, there will be more like computational power that we can have access to, yeah? So I think this is the right time to do uh, computational research because previously, a lot of studies may have been limited to very small systems or to like what we call the proof of concept or demonstrations. You cannot really use it for actual material design, but it's more like to demonstrate that, okay, this idea might work. But nowadays or 10 years later, or, or we do have the computational uh, capability to use those kind of ideas to design materials. So that is why I'm very fascinated with the, this area. And, uh, yeah. So I started learning modeling and the simulation when I was uh, an exchange student. So like uh, something like uh, 16 years ago. You know, at that time, the computers I use compared to the computers I use now. You know, you know, so this is a, a big difference. So this is just one aspect uh, about the, uh, basically the hardware, hardware uh, computational power. But if you think about the algorithms that we use for doing model, modeling or computer material science, 
they have also evolved. Uh, I mean, because there are many more people are working in this area, so we have more and more simulation tools available. If you do not believe this, just uh, check out on GitHub. You know, uh, people are publishing their codes every day, right, on a daily basis. You know, more and more uh, ideas are proposed. This is uh, clearly demonstrated with this so-called machine learning algorithms for material design. You know, this is an area where a lot of people are working on at the moment. Um, a lot of algorithms are being developed. It has almost been an exponential growth also in the algorithms that we use. On the other hand, I mean, the tools are also getting easier and more convenient to use. They are like more like what we call handy, handy tools. You know, previously, maybe many of the tools are just uh, you know, source codes. And then you have, or sometimes you have to even write our own codes to do more modeling. But now this is more like, uh, you know, you have people develop codes, but there are also people or companies who make those codes more friendly, more user friendly. So it's uh, what I would call the, the barrier, the learning barrier is, it has been significantly reduced, uh, I think in the, in the past decade. And I, I believe that this trend will go on for some time. You know, we will have more, uh, like more powerful algorithms and you know, more powerful computers, more powerful like, uh, algorithms, and also more uh, user-friendly tools to use. Okay. And like previously, we do have to do maybe a PhD to be able to use those tools. Now I think an undergrad degree or even even undergrad student can, can just be expert in those tools. Okay, so uh, what are the tools that we use in my lab? Uh, we use mainly, okay, so we, we have access to the Chinese National Supercomputing Center in Shenzhen. So by connect to this uh, high performance server, so we can submit the simulation jobs there. So we uh, students in my group, we use uh, a lot of the resources there, okay? But uh, this year, uh, in this year, we have also this Shabbat HPC cluster being set up on campus. So uh, we can also submit simulation jobs to this Shabbat uh, HPC. Uh, this is uh, a high performance computing units on campus. In addition to those, we also use laptops, uh, workstations, or slightly more powerful workstations uh, in, or in my research group, okay? Uh, together with the collab our collaborators, we do have some international collaborators. Through our collaborators, we also have access to some of the computational resources in other places. I mean, not only in this one in Shenzhen, but also other places in China, in Europe and also in the U US, Canada, etc. So actually as a student, if you look for computational resources, actually many, many, many of uh, these high, perform uh, high performance computing units, they offer computational hours. Uh, some, some of them are free, actually. many of them are free to students to test. Yeah? Uh, some of you may actually use, for example, this Google Colab to do some, 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 some simulations or calculations. This is kind of the same idea. Uh, yes. In addition to those, we also we do a, a little bit of a theoretical studies. We're trying to reduce the computational cost by developing uh, better or, or maybe what do I call more like uh, economical algorithms. Uh, so. We, they, you know, there's a balance between accuracy and the uh, computational cost. We do, in our, in, in our own research, we do play with this kind of balance between uh, being very accurate and also being more like economical. In that case, some of the simulations that we do just to use ordinary workstations. Okay. Uh, in the remaining time, let me just quickly introduce some of the ongoing research projects. 
uh, that uh, me and my students and the collaborators are working on. So we have been working with something called the ion, ion exchange membranes. Uh, so if the idea here is trying to develop uh, this membrane that can be more like chemically stable and also has better uh, transport properties for the hydroxide ions, okay? So in this case, there are a number of options are available for the, uh, the, the chemical group. So the idea here is that, okay, which one is better? Which one offers us better property? In experiments, uh, we, we do have the, the research team of Professor Mendebayeva, they do a lot of experiments. So they play with the different uh, head groups and also different, uh, like different polymers, trying to find which one gives better performance. Uh, but this is also a very nice pro system for computational design. So we, in the computers, we can play with those different chemical groups and trying to understand uh, its chemical stability, why it can be stable or why it cannot be stable, etc. And we also study the transport mechanism of hydroxide ion. In this case, we are mainly doing uh, quantum chemical calculations and molecular dynamics simulations. Okay. Together with my collaborator, we have been studying this problem for quite some time. It's about uh, electrostatics at uh, dielectric interfaces. This is a very fundamental uh, problem. If you think about uh, like ion batteries or like even solar cells, you know, at the, usually there is a solid liquid interface. And at the liquid solid interface, usually there are a lot of charges, ions, or surface charges, so how they interact with each other. Uh, of course, uh, this is a, you know, this kind of systems are already introduced in physical chemistry textbooks. But in the classical theories, uh, people make a lot of assumptions. Some of the assumptions are accurate, uh, are reasonable. Some of the assumptions are introduced just to make it uh, solvable, make it easier to solve. But nowadays we have a, uh, like high performance computers. So we may, do, we do not need to make some of the assumptions just to make it easier to solve. We can just include all those different influences and trying to see what are the differences. Okay, so this is the area that I also work a lot. Uh, in this case, we are doing mainly molecular dynamic simulations and also what we call the cost grain. So uh, molecular dynamic simulations. But the, the, the scientific problem here is the uh, interfacial uh, electrostatics and the interfacial electrodynamics. Okay, because, so, because, for example, if you have uh, external electric field, how the ions are moving around. So that would be, uh, this is uh, something that we see in a lot of these uh, energy storage devices. Together with the Professor Lei Wong at the School of Mining and Geosciences, we also use modeling, so uh, modeling and simulation to study some of the problems in the traditional en energy sector, like oil, gas, and the coal uh, industry. I mean, those industries are vital, are very important to the economy of Kazakhstan. So uh, we are trying to, uh, so we have several ongoing research projects in this area related to, for example, uh, enhanced oil recovery. In that case, the problem is also related to, you know, you have interface, you have rock, oil, and then maybe rock, oil, water interface. So what's going on at the interface, at the molecular scale? So that are the things we are trying to study using, or we are studying using molecular simulations. We also have projects that are related to the uh, coal industry, uh, the coal methane uh, production. So in that case, we have the gas molecules and also the, the coal bed, so the solid gas uh, interactions. I'm also very interested uh, in the uh, idea of uh, CO2 
uh, capture and uh, sequestration, so CO2 storage. In that case, you also have uh, uh, gas or a fluid, and then you have uh, uh, solid interactions. Okay. For, for instance, the use of CO2 in oil recovery, that is a very uh, important subject that is being studied. I'm always uh, interested in concrete because that's my research hobby for, for quite some time. So uh, together with uh, Professor Papadanasio in Greece, we are working with uh, uh, the use of phase change materials in, for building applications. So uh, you know, this type of phase change materials, they can change its phase like from the solid to liquid under a certain temperature. So uh, this gives uh, opportunities for use them as a thermal barrier or, or energy storage. There has been many ongoing studies in this area. For example, you might ha have heard of like how to build uh, a building with the zero energy consumption. Yeah? So how to optimize the building materials so that it's uh, it doesn't, for example, we can use elect less electricity for heating in the winter and also less electricity for cooling in the summer. So one of the idea is to use phase change materials uh, in the walls. Yeah? So, but then what exactly, uh, which type of phase change material you use and uh, how to design the material so that it's more efficient. Yeah, a lot of very interesting engineering uh, questions in this area. And uh, very recently, we have got a new project that is related to the uh, trying to understand the uh, heat transfer mechanism in ceramic materials. And those ceramic ceramic materials are used in, for example, nuclear power plant. But the idea here is that okay, so if we have a certain structure, like material which has a certain type of structure, we will have a certain type of. Uh, heat transfer property or for example thermal conductivity right but then if we alter if we if we engineeringly alter the microstructure of the material how does that affect the thermal property okay so in professor Wooderglove's group they do a lot of measurements so the they design different type of microstructures and they measure the thermal transport thermal conductivity i think um, we are collaborating together, trying to develop also simulation models, trying to predict uh, the thermal conductivity. The good thing of modeling here is that uh, sometimes it's not very easy to control the microstructure by experiments, but with the modeling, you can easily, very easily manipulate different type of microstructures. So the, I think I see a lot of opportunities in this area is that uh, which is also an advantage for simulation is that you can design the materials arbitrarily. And then, you know, the idea is that if you can find a particular structure which gives better optimal thermal properties, and then engineers will find a way to make those structures, right? So this is a, what I see a, a big advantage of modeling. The main technique we use in this area so to, to compute the thermal transport properties, there are mainly uh, quantum mechanical, this, this kind of quantum mechanic based uh, electronic structure calculations or the so-called DFT calculations. But another method is what we call the non-equilibrium molecular dynamic simulations. But, but the, the main subject is to study this energy transport or, or heat transport at the nanoscale. Uh, I have some a, a few other uh, projects. One uh, of the projects is related to the uh, is related to polymer processing, like how to process polymers, uh, how to process not only just the pure plastics but also uh, plastics with the filler particles, trying to make a polymer composite. 
So I'm involved in a research team led by Professor Dong Ming Wei in mathematics. We are trying to use different types of mathematical modeling to understand uh, the behavior of those complex fluids uh, and the processing conditions. And then in this case, we can uh, also optimize the like the processing or what we call the, the design of the instrument, design of the, the dye for polymer processing. Uh, I believe in Kazakhstan, polymer processing has, uh, is, is going to be very, very important because you have heard of, uh, you might have heard of some of the very big uh, chemical projects that has been launched in the Atarao area to produce a lot of polymers. There has been a plan to produce polypropylene. There will be a plan to produce polyethylene with the annual production close to 1 million tons per year. So uh, with this uh, amount of polymers being produced, I think that is, well, there will be a demand for the polymer processing industry to further develop here. Uh, this is the last project that I'm going to introduce. This is the work by my PhD students uh, uh, about Jodosov. So in this case, we are working with, uh, uh, this is project I liked a lot. It's something related to a very hot topic that is uh, microplastics, you know. Yes, we do use a lot of polymers nowadays, but you know, people are concerned about the use of uh, plastics or the original use of plastics, because over the years, you know, since polymers are being introduced, again, about 100 years ago, so the, we have accumulated a lot of waste plastics on Earth. Uh, you might have heard, read in the news about uh, those plastics in the ocean, or plastics in soil, lakes, rivers, and over time, they break into these small plastic particles, which is called microplastics, and uh, this has been a very big concern nowadays, so whether those microplastics are harmful or not. But the PhD project of Abad is, so we are trying to ask another question. Okay, so maybe this pure microplastics, they, they may be harmful to human body or they may, they, may, they may be not. I mean, it's difficult to argue. I know a lot of uh, biologists are working in this area, trying to study whether they are harmful or not. But the truth is, you know, we do not usually see those pure microplastics. You know, if they are exposed in the ambient environment or in river, in lakes, they will absorb other chemicals. You know, we have other pollutants in those areas. So if there is, for example, an enrichment mechanism, if the can absorb those other pollutants, which we know are toxic. Yeah, so these microplastics, if uh, they are accumulated in human body, they would probably be toxic as well, right? So in this case, we are trying to study different pollutants and how they absorb to microplastics. So our body is using molecular simulations, trying to understand those interactions between different types of pollutants and different types of microplastics. Okay, so uh, this is just a, a quick summary. Uh, this is something I often tell my students in chemical and materials engineering. Usually, if you think about the research topics of an individual group or individual professor, those areas are more or less very much limited. But the application of chemicals and material science is very broad. Uh, nowadays, if you think about uh, all those sectors in society, we use a lot of chemicals, a lot of materials, or in terms of chemicals, we do not often use pure chemicals anymore. Usually you use formulated chemicals or what we call the consumer, customer-based, customer, -based, customer uh, products, yeah? so. It, those chemicals you buy in supermarket, they are not pure chemicals. Most of them are formulated products. So how to design those formulated products. In terms of material science, again, uh, you know, a lot of research has been done on pure components, 
but uh, many of the interesting applications of those materials are not a pure materials. They are uh, composite materials. They are uh, like you have, uh, they have uh, this combination of different types of materials. So how do we in design the structure of those uh, composite materials? How we uh, optimize interface of those materials? Now, lots of uh, research can be done. Yeah? So we all know like BSF is a chemical company. They also label them as a the chemical company, but uh, actually their products are used in all sectors of the society. I think they uh, just want to give, if there are chemical engineering students in the, in, in the audience, just want to you know, give you a broad overview of what we do in chemical engineering. Okay, so here I listed some of the papers we published this year. Uh, those are the research that we are, do, uh, that we are doing at the moment. Uh, if you are interested in any of those studies, feel free to write me. Uh, okay. So in this presentation, I want to emphasize the uh, importance of uh, computational materials uh, engineering or computational methods, the use of computational approaches in chemical and materials engineering. This has been um, well recognized in academia and also it has been well organized in industry. A lot of these big industries, including BSF, they have a team to do this competitional product design. So if you are interested, you can also search the competitional research and BSF, you can find a lot of interesting studies, okay? And in my lab, we use uh, different modeling techniques, uh, including theory, modeling simulation, and in the future, we will include data informatics and machine learning, trying to uh, solve some of the questions uh, in energy and advanced materials area. Okay, so uh, our main target is advanced materials for energy applications, and the main tools are those different modeling methods. And we have uh, many ongoing collaborations with other teams at NU and also international researchers. Uh, I didn't list many of the students, but I do interact with a lot of students here at NU. And we are always welcome uh, comments. So comments are always welcome. And also we also like the students here to challenge our, our work and to provide new ideas to our research. And all of those interactions are largely welcome. So with that, I will finish. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very great. I think everyone liked the point that uh, like nowadays research, it should not be limited with one area, like biologists can, it should be like all uh, like programming, programming, biology, chemistry, physics. Exactly, exactly. I totally agree with you, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, like in your, uh, you have a quite a large number of ongoing questions, ongoing projects, and I have a question like, how do you manage? Mm -hmm. How do you cope uh, with all these projects? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a very good point. But uh, you see, I'm introducing my lab, <laughs> so it's not only only uh, we have a uh, we have a uh, we do have several uh, uh, research. I I listed some postdocs, right? We have, we have a few postdocs. We also have some PhD students. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the lab, we also have a, a few uh, like uh, employees. Uh, we are, I think with, uh, with more support from the university, we all have, we all have more like uh, full-time uh, researchers. Yeah. But uh, I do keep track most of the studies with having all kinds of meetings. The good thing with the, uh, Computational work is that uh, we don't have to meet physically. You know? So, this pandemic has not uh, affected uh, our research much. Actually, now we have more meetings than before because people are used to have those virtual meetings. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, students, do you have any other questions? 
Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed that. Like, uh, personally, right now I'm studying like linguistics and uh, machine learning. So uh -huh. in my future, I would like to computational linguistics, and, like, some machine stuff. So I really like uh -huh. going to those. Like, yeah. This, we are changing uh, to the computers. But yeah. I have a question. Um, I'm quite interested in that. Like, how do you cope with the burnout? Like, I mean, having lots of projects, working for people. Uh, oh, how do I manage? Your, yeah, your burnout. <laughs> like, I didn't because it was the background was a bit noisy. I couldn't hear you well. Sorry. <laughs> Wait a second. Are you in a bar or something? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Wait a second. Yes, now it's clear. Yes, now, now I can hear you better. Yes. Yeah, like how do you cope with the burnout? The burn, burnout? Well, well, emo em emotional, emotional burnout. It's like, it's the thing, like the thing when you have like, uh, when you're tired of your work, when you're tired <laughs> of your project, yeah. when you're getting exhaustion. How exactly. do you cope with that? <laughs> okay, how do you yeah. manage like staying like fine exactly. yeah that, that, that's that's a very good point yes um thank you for the questions arena yes uh you see i interact with a lot of students i uh, there are many students in my group and uh, uh sometimes yes i do as, as the pi i do push them a bit but uh, on the other hand i cannot push them too much because uh, you know we all have lots of stresses nowadays right so I, I think my suggestion to my students and also to myself is that, uh, so that, there should be a balance, right? There should be a balance between work and also life and, and, uh, and healthy, personal healthy, right? So if you're tired, you're tired. That, that's, uh, so just give us a break, right? So yeah, it's, it's fine. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's very important that, okay, especially for the PIs, because we do have, a, we, if we are assigned as a PI, we have some pressure, we have to deliver something by the end. So that's, uh, there's enormous pressure on us. And also when we assign those research contracts to students, like uh, if you are working at the RA, you have this contract. And in, 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 a, in a way, there's also pressure on the students because uh, you know, by the end you have to deliver something. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult because you also have exam and also course assignments, etc. So uh, my suggestion to my uh, students here is that, uh, okay, uh, you know what you have to deliver by the end. So there, there, there's something we have to deliver. And, uh, and we also, there, you know, there will be difficulties, there are those kind of stresses or unexpected kind of assignments from different uh, you know, professors, etc. But the thing is, you have to let your professor know in advance, you know. <laughs> so uh, explain uh, to him your stresses. This is very important because uh, sometimes by, you know, I, I also had this, this has happened to me before. It's like by the you know, we, we have, may have already extended the deadline several times. At some point, we have to deliver something. And then the students wrote maybe to me by the last minute that, you know, he couldn't do it. Uh, this is not very good because uh, uh, this gives me very little window to help, you know. <laughs> so uh, don't be afraid of asking for help from uh, your professor, your, your your maybe your if you have collaborators like collaborative students, work we work with a group. Don't feel shy to speak out your difficulties. Uh, let them know uh, in advance. <laughs> you know, we are. Uh, I think we are all very nice people. We want to help, but uh, it's important to have some window, time window, for, so that we can help. You know, so so that's. Uh, okay, so I think my I have two points here. One is that there should be a balance, so we cannot don't work too hard. So that that's one thing we have to uh, keep healthy uh, mentally and physically. And the other thing is like uh, you know we have lots of difficulties, a lot of stresses, and 
uh, talk to people, uh, talk to your professor and then let them know about your difficulties. And uh, I, I believe that uh, most of our professors or maybe all professors are very reasonable person. So they will understand, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, don't, don't take all the stresses uh, by yourself, you know, sometimes it can be, it can be very difficult. Yes. Uh, also about what you said that you are interested in computational linguistics. I didn't uh, introduce today, but uh, in the lab, in my, in the CMC lab, we do have a research team, a, a research team that they do computational linguistics. We have this team before I joined the lab, they are working with, I think they are using AI for something of an, an analysis of the Kazakh language. Um, we are trying to merge those two areas together, but, uh, but we are, this is something we are still kind of working on, but, uh, but we do have a team working with the competition and linguistics, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor. And there is one more question uh, in chat. Okay, let me take a look. Uh, is it possible? Uh, yes, so I think I got a question in the chat from uh, Bayer. So is it possible to experimental physicists to change their topic to a computational theoretical direction. Um, I believe so, I believe so. I think vice versa. So it's also possible for computational physicists to change the major to be uh, an experimental physicist. I know some successful stories, people who changed their major. Uh, you know, I even know people, for example, who studied the mathematics in undergrad and they become very, very good chemists. Uh, as a researcher, you know, th all those things can happen. I don't know, yeah, for, I think for students, definitely you can. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to be experts in both, you know, both competitional and experimental, and you are experts in both. There are some success, successful stories in that as well, but uh, not many, not very many. Uh, but it's very important that, you know, for example, even if you work with the like your, your main research area is experimental area, experimental physicist. But uh, I think you should uh, uh, like uh, try to understand a bit of the basics of a competitional physicist. At least, you know, for students, we do teach both, right? So you should also read the papers in the kind of competitional physicist area. Even if you may not do this kind of research by yourself, it's very important to be able to understand your collaborators, uh, understand the language that your collaborators are using. Sometimes it could happen that, you know, when people is talking uh, in one language, even both are work working with the same problem in physics, but they may use different uh, kind of assumptions, different uh, languages even, right? So uh, it's important to understand both. Yes. Thank my supervisor, you. sorry, actually, yeah, let me just give you one example. My supervisor, he, he's not a, a, a physicist, well, he, can, he considered himself like a, a chemical engineer, engineer and also like a, what we call the rheologist, people who study flow of different fluids. So he is a competitional rheologist. Uh, he worked with competitional rheologists for quite some time in his career, but then uh, you know, he was looking for experimental collaborators to do some kind of experiments for his competitions. And then he couldn't find a suitable collaborator. So in the end, he said, okay, why maybe I could just do the experiment myself. So about 20 years ago, he changed his uh, area. Oh, there's an advantage of being a professor is that you can hire students, right? You can have a, a different students work with different problems. But uh, he changed his, uh, basically, you know, how we label a person. Like uh, he, previously he was labeled as a, a computational rheologist, and now he's become an experimentalist. You know, it's actually very, very well known experimentalist. Yes. Yeah, professor, thank you. Thank you for your examples. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have my 
email address here. Uh, and also, I think at NU it's very easy to find people. So it, you can just uh, feel free to write to me. Okay, very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so guys, if you don't have any questions, I think we are done uh, today. Uh, I thank you, Professor. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your time. Uh, all was good, great. And um, so I think uh, we could end. Okay, um, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, also, bye bye. Take yes. care. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Congratulations with the uh, semester ending, and I wish you good luck. Uh, in our new year uh, with all your projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.